This talk was presented at Google I.O. Extended Grand Rapids in 2023. All right, so my name is Carlos Henry. Uh, for those of you that know me, um, the, probably the most interesting thing about me is that I have seven children. My oldest is 21, and my youngest we just had in February, Valentine. He's three months old, so my house is literally crazy all the time. I, I can't believe they allowed me to put this presentation together, but it's something I really feel strongly about. So, you know, I have a very understanding family and, and they made it work. So um, I'm an independent contractor. I'm focusing primarily on you know software development, but more importantly, helping to build more highly performing teams. And that's kind of the start of this talk. Um, Today's talk is, of course, titled Scrum is not a silver bullet. It will not solve all your problems. That's basically what I'm saying. But I'm also going to give a little bit of a charge here and say that not only will it not solve all your problems, but it most likely is creating new ones. I, I can't, I, how do I say this? Not trying to start a flame war here. I know there's a lot of people here who have experience with with Scrum. So it's also not going to be all gloom and doom. I will share like some good news. Can you guys hear me in the back? I know there was some concern. Okay. I'll share some good news at the end, but it's going to sound like I'm really hating on Scrum. Okay. So just to forewarn. Cool. It worked. So show of hands, how many people are familiar with the Scrum framework? Oh yeah, everybody. Okay. Show of hands, how many people are using Scrum? Oh, <laughs> it's a lot of hands that went up. We didn't see you guys are either going to hate me or love me by the end of this. We'll see. More importantly, how many people are using the big brother of Scrum, the older, more mature? Oh, it didn't flip. The older, more mature, safe. Show of hands. <laughs> okay. You guys didn't see there's a lot of hands that went up. Um, yeah. So hold on to your horses. Here we go. What was that? No, good. Okay. Here we go. All right. So I need to pay attention, make sure the slides are changing. So before I completely start dissing, disrespecting Scrum, dismantling it, talking about all the problems that it brings, I have to give props where props is due, proper respect. I've used Scrum for the better part of a decade or two, and I've had a lot of success with it. We've delivered with some of these guys here and sprinkled out throughout, we've delivered a ton of value through the Scrum process. One of the benefits that it gave us is it brought a lot of order to chaos. So we had this big agile movement. Prior to that was all waterfall. I can see myself tripping on this wire. Um, but now that we're here post agile, there's a process that we came up with called Scrum. And sure enough, a lot of companies have seen a lot of success with it, including myself, I've seen a lot of success happening. Uh, one of the biggest things that it brought was a common language. Excuse me. All right. Okay. One of the things that it brought is a common language between engineers and the business. Sprints, stand-ups, program increments. All these things are widely known throughout our organization, not just from the engineering side, but also from the business side. Those are wonderful, great additions that Scrum has brought us. Makes you wonder if Scrum is so great, why in the world am I bringing this talk today? Good. I will say that there's a ton of benefits for Scrum, but there's also a ton of negative points when it comes to Scrum as well. Let me know by show of hands, have you ever heard this quote? Our team, Velocity is 30 points. What's your velocity? 17? <laughs> that's crap. You know, and that's that's kind of the mentality it brings with it, right? In addition to, hey, make sure my name is on that story. Because I want to make sure that I get the points for that story. You guys ever heard that before? Or better yet, some engineer says, I accomplished half the points of my sprint. You guys need to respect me, right? And that's it's kind of the connotation that comes along with it, right? So these things are completely opposed to building teams and more importantly, opposed to building highly performing teams. 
once again, these are not things that Scrum actually prescribes, but it is something that ends up happening when it comes to leveraging Scrum. I see some nods. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. So I just want to share my story. Um, like I said before, I've been really successful with using Scrum in the past and it worked out great. But lo and behold, I joined a team that showed me a different way. Um, this team that I joined, <laughs> it was a handful of engineers and this handful of engineers already had a good working relationship. They were already working together in previous projects and they knew how to flow. Um, and if you never worked with me before, something that I typically say a lot of is like, I want to be as efficient as possible. And so I just want to trim the fat off of everything. You know, anything that's not necessary, that's wasteful, I just want to get rid of it. So a lot of people here probably uh, on development teams use pull requests. Pull requests, one of the things that really ticks me off about pull requests is that you create a pull request, so you're the creator, someone reviews it, they put a comment in, say, hey, you should consider doing this. And the question is, okay, do, is this just a suggestion or are they holding my pull request ransom until I make this change? So, right, because that happens. So I said, in order for us to be more efficient on this team, let's come up with this whole process. So whenever there's a comment on a PR, you need to indicate, hey, this is a suggestion or, hey, you need to make this change in order to get my approval. So I talked it out with the team said, hey, guys, we should come up with this process to do this. this. So it's really clear and we know exactly what's happening. And they said, no, we're not, we're not doing pull requests. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're not going to do pull requests? How are you going to make sure that uh, the code is quality, high quality? How are you going to make sure that people aren't introducing bugs into the code base, right? So I moved over to the next... Next thing, story pointing, scrum team, begin out, right? Are we gonna use the Fibonacci series? Are we gonna go small, medium, high, complexity, things like that? Hey, if we're gonna use a Fibonacci series, one, three, five, sorry, one, two, three, five, eight. Let's come up with the common understanding of what a three is. You spend all this time figuring out what a three is and agree with it on a team basis. Then you can say if the story is higher than a three or lower than a three. Let's do that. They're like, no, we're not doing story pointing. <laughs> so in my mind is like, I'm baffled at this point. Okay, so we're not gonna do story pointing. How are we gonna determine velocity? How are we gonna determine, do capacity planning? Things like that. More importantly, what about all those vanity metrics that we just know and love? You know, in terms of, hey, I got this many points done. Hey, I did this. That goes completely out the window. So one by one, this team that I joined, they just started destroying everything. They destroyed sprints, increments. They destroyed my clickers now. Sprint planning, gone. Backlog grooming, gone. Completely getting rid of everything. And so I said, this, this has to be the worst implementation of Scrum I've ever seen. And they must have been reading my mind because they were like, who said we're doing Scrum? Right. So at this point, I'm kind of losing it. Like, there is no way. How, how is this going to work? Side note, I don't know why all the pictures I found of black men in for this presentation <laughs> have red shirts on, but it just it just happened. OK. Anyway, so I saw this project being complete chaos, like it was going to be anarchy. There's no way we're going to be successful at all. However. I did know that this team had worked together in the past and they seemed pretty confident. So <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, okay, we'll give it a whirl. We'll see, we'll see what happens. At this point is when I started to take a step back and I wanted to kind of think, why am I being, why am I so frustrated with this approach? And the reason why I was frustrated with this approach, sorry, not the reason why. A lot of times when you're frustrated, it's really an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn. You know, you can take the position of I'm frustrated, 
So that thing that I'm frustrated about, that should change. That's one approach. And you can do that. That a lot of times you don't have the control over. Instead, I think it's more important to start with your perspective. Like, what is it that you're being challenged? What is it, how can you grow? So I took that route. Why was this bothering me so much? You know, for many years, Scrum was how I developed software, how I delivered value to my customers. And I realized Scrum is not the same thing as delivering value or delivering software, period. But somehow in my mind, I got that confused. I confused a process for how to deliver software or being the same thing as delivering software. In other words, if you're not doing Scrum, you're not delivering software correctly. If you're not doing SAFE, which is the best marketing name ever, right? Like if your your company is not doing SAFE, you're not SAFE. That's, that's great. Whoever came up with that, you know, kudos to them. But putting your faith in the process, yeah, I know. <laughs> putting your faith in the process to deliver software doesn't really make a lot of sense. Would you guys agree or no? You guys feel okay? I see we're hitting that. Okay, good. Here we go. So if we can't rely on a process, Scrum, Safe, whatever the process, fill in the blank, what is it that we can rely on? The Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto came together in 2001. 2001, it's over 22 years old. It is literally the only thing invented or built by software engineers that's over 20 years old that people don't call legacy and dismiss, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's amazing. Why is it not legacy? The reason why it's not legacy is because all the values, all the principles that it houses are still applicable today. I think the genius of the Agile Manifesto is the fact that they did not develop a process. They said, these are the principles these are what we value, stick with that. So if you haven't read it, it's really short, just take the time to read it. But we're gonna dive into a couple of principles and I'm gonna kind of show you where things kind of fall apart when it comes to the Agile principles and Scrum and Safe. I am clicking it. Here we go. Value number one, individuals, and interactions over processes and tools. I could like drop the mic. Done, right? So individuals over process and tools, period. If your process, safe, scrum, fill in the blank, is not adaptable enough to react to the needs of the people on your team, you're doing something, but it's not agile. Right? Okay, I haven't won you guys over yet, but it's coming. Okay, here we go. So this kind of reminds me of the lean movement. Has anyone done any kind of reading or research about lean, lean manufacturing, lean software development? Okay, good, good, perfect. All right, instead of the top-down approach, which is what we're all used to, it should be a grassroots effort coming up. In other words, the process shouldn't dictate what should be done. Instead, the teams should have more power. They should be empowered to make decisions that's best for the teams to deliver what they need to deliver. As a matter of fact, I'll go so bold to say, next time you're in a team meeting and someone starts talking about processes and important this process is, and you feel like they're not listening to you or they're not paying attention to the individuals, I want you to stand up and like put your fist in the air and be like, power to the people. Okay, don't do that. That, would, that, would, that wouldn't go well. <laughs> All right, value number four. Yes, I skipped a couple, but I'm going to try to get through this. Value number four, responding to change or following a plan. How many, I'm, I'm not even going to ask because that's kind of embarrassing, but I've actually been part of organizations that they'll say, hey, as soon as the sprint begins, customer, stakeholder, you can't change priority. That's what we're doing. That's what we're committing to. We're committing to these things in the sprint. That's it. That's stupid, right? That makes no sense. That doesn't sound like agile by any means. 
If a customer wants to change their mind every day, that's fine. We should be able to allow that. As software engineers del delivering value to our customers, we should be able to be able to respond to change any point in time, period. I don't care if it's the beginning of the sprint, end of the sprint, on the weekends. Okay, maybe not the weekends, but just we should be able to respond to change. I'm going to jump into the principles. So the highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of software. I underline continuous delivery because I'm going to interpret that in the spirit that I think they meant it. So continuous delivery, we've made a, a huge effort to define that as at any point in time, software is ready to be deployed. I don't think they meant that. I think they meant what we call continuous deployment. Think about it. At what point in time does software actually provide value? When it's stuck in the branch? When your feature's just sitting out there? When it's merged to the main branch, but it's not deployed to production? No. The only time that it really gives value is when it's out in prod and customers and users are using it. Should that be relegated to only once a year? No. Should it be relegated to the end of a quarter, the end of a month? Already at the end of a sprint? No. We should be deploying software to production all the time, period. If we're not doing it, we're not really providing the amount of value that we could be providing. All right, so now back to my story. So I'm working with this team. They've already like shot down everything that I thought was sacred, right? They shot down pull requests. They shot down story points. They shot down sprints. So what are we doing then? No pull requests. Going back to the questions I had, how are we going to ensure quality? Can you guys see? I might be sitting in front. Okay, that's right. I'm short. Sure. Come on. Click. Pair programming. Oh, pair programming. Okay. I used to hate the idea of pair programming. I used to think it was stupid. Okay. The idea that two engineers working together on the same computer in order to develop software, come on. Like, who's really going to pay for that? Right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's where I was. But then you think about it PRs are horrible. P pull requests is like a nightmare. And it's a nightmare for everyone involved. I don't have a lot of evidence for this claim, but I'm pretty sure PRs came from hell. Like, seriously. <laughs> Um, if you're the creator of a PR, what's the appropriate amount of time to wait before someone reviews it, right? I'm going to show this. I probably shouldn't. This is one of my PRs, <laughs> right? Seven days ago, okay? And I'll be honest, I took this picture yesterday. So I've had a PR sitting out there for seven days that still hasn't been reviewed. That's dumb. Think about it. It's a five-day work week, right? And this team that... I'm working with does two week sprints. So you mean to tell me that half the sprint, the feature was done. No one's PR it. Like it hasn't even crossed the threshold of getting to the main branch. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Um, but it's not just on the creator, right? The reviewer has, I mean, PRs are horrible for reviewers as well. You as a reviewer, you're expected to stop whatever it is you're doing. You know, put all your priorities aside, right? It doesn't matter what you were working on. Now take the time to look at someone else's code, try to get into the head of what exactly they were doing, try to understand the requirements that they're trying to fulfill, make sure there's no programmatic errors, make sure there's no issues when it comes to the, the, the fulfilling the requirements. Um, and then, of course, you might have to be the bearer of bad news that this developers spent the past three days building something and building it against or completely opposed to the architecture that the software was going for. That's horrible, right? It's also horrible for teams because like I said before, you have to come up with some kind of policy for keeping track of what changes are just suggestions versus changes that are mandatory in order to release the code. Not only that, but you also have to come up with an agreement of how long should PRs exist. All this maintenance, all this waste can just completely be eliminated with just pair programming. 
Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing. So pair programming also has other benefits as well, right? No longer are you in the situation where only one developer understands a feature or one developer understands how a system works. If everyone's pairing together, it just everyone's sharing that knowledge. Story pointing. <laughs> if we're not going to do story points, how are we going to plan? How are we going to track velocity? How do we know what this team can accomplish? Story counts. Has anyone heard about this? Raise your hand. Ooh, this, okay, good, okay. This is amazing. So this is a game changer, okay? If you don't walk away from anything, please kind of remember this section of this talk. So what they found is velocity can be determined not by the number of points you've earned over a period of time or each sprint. All you gotta do is count the stories. Literally, how many stories did your team complete over X amount of time? If you do that, you can track velocity. You can figure out how much your team is capable of completing. No more story points. No more stupid, long meetings with every developer inside the meeting, doing planet poker, figuring out how many points something is worth, arguing over a story if it's worth three points or five points. You know. It's just a waste of time. Just get rid of it. Done. Look at this monstrosity. That's ridiculous, right? But someone took the effort to try to come up with some kind of standardized process on how to point stories. They're taking into consideration uncertainty, complexity, effort, and all that kind of stuff. Not too dissimilar, then let's come up with a three story. A three point story is worth this. Therefore, this is higher, this is lower, and we'll figure it out from there. It's a waste of time. No sprints. Well, how do you determine velocity? You use cycle time. From the, well, I'm sorry, I got a slide for this. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay. If your team, it's real, it's hard math. If your team completes five stories in a week, come on, and there's 50 stories remaining in the backlog, it's gonna take you 10 weeks. I just saved you 10 hours of meetings just right there, cycle time. So where, how is all this backed up? I mean, I'm, I'm really grossing over some details. I really am. I understand that. But I will share this. Here's an example of a study that a team did. And there's many studies out there. A team did basically comparing historically how many points they earned over time versus if they would have just counted the stories. Not a lot of difference. Except for all the time that was wasted and up team meetings over the course of a project, trying to figure out, determine how many points every story is worth. So this, what I'm sharing has to do with the no estimate movement. I'm not a Twitter guy. I got seven kids. I ain't got time for that. But there is like hashtag no estimates. There's two people's name, Alan Hullub. I'm probably hoping I'm spelling it or pronouncing that right. He's got a great talk called No Estimates on YouTube. Please check it out. But more importantly, Vasco Duarte, who wrote a book called No Estimates, and I kind of gave you the punchline. Basically, if you do story counting, you can accomplish the same thing and just be done. Okay, if we're not doing sprints, how do we communicate that we're releasing to production? Because our customers are expecting us to release production at the end of each sprint, right? Continuous deployment. <laughs> So if you're like me and you originally heard someone talk about continuous deployment, you might have thought that this is just vanity metrics for big companies like Google and Amazon who can afford to do this. I will say that we probably can't afford, I'm going to do a double negative, we can't afford not to do this. As software professionals, we should be working extremely hard to get to continuous deployment. What do I mean by continuous deployment? So this team that I'm working with, they were like, every single time we merge to the main branch is going to prod. 
I looked at them like they were crazy. Absolutely ridiculous. But it's working. And not only that, it's working well. It's, 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 I don't know how to describe it. It's just, I'm floored. You know, a lot of times people, what they will bring up when it comes to continuous deployment is risk. So let's talk about risk for a minute. What's more risky? Two developers working on a piece of software for a year before deploying it to prod or two developers working on a piece of software for a month before deploying it to prod. The year is obviously more risky, right? Because a year is a longer amount of time. There's a lot more changes that you're introducing into production in one fell swoop as opposed to a month. Okay. Well, typically what we have is two week sprints. So what's more risky? Two developers working on features for two weeks and deploying it to prod or two developers working on a feature for a day and deploying it to prod. The two for a day is a lot less riskier. Why? Because there's a lot less change you're introducing into production. Continuous deployment actually minimizes risk. It doesn't increase it. Here's a favorite. Late night deploys. I'm not going to ask. I'm going to ask. Is there anybody here who works for an organization? Oh, that's, well, I'm going to ask. Is there anybody here who works for an organization that does late night deploys? Oh, baby. Yep. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, late night or weekends. It's horrible, right? It, 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 it shouldn't happen. Who loves it? Who loves getting up in the middle of the night or staying up to like, you know, midnight for a deployment, telling your wife and the kids that I'm sorry, baby, I got to I got to do this. That's that's doesn't make any sense. Everyone has to get online in the middle of the night. Most of the time you wait for DevOps to do something manual. So you everyone goes on mute. You're probably playing. What's that silly game? You're probably playing. What is it? The oh, I wish I had it. Sorry. The soccer game with the cars. Yeah, you're probably playing Rocket League with your friends, right? Waiting for your turn to be, your name to be called so that you can do something, right? It's, it's ridiculous. It's a waste of time. If you do continuous deployment, that goes away completely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call Rocket League stupid. <laughs> okay, this, this is the one I really hate. Okay, late night deploys are pretty bad, but this is really bad. So your team or multiple teams have developed software. They push it to prod at the end of the sprints. There's a bug. Oh, no, there's an issue. Your customer probably wants to roll the code back. But what they don't realize is not only are they rolling the bug back, they're also rolling back all the features from the other developers that were pushed out there. That's horrible. We're going backwards for something silly, right? Continuous deployment solves that too. Oh, I'm at the end, okay, here we go. In summary, I hate waste. I just wanna get rid of it. It's completely, you know, something that's like my enemy. Like I just wanna just destroy it. Scrum and safe encourage a lot of waste, period. I hope I've shown how. But there is good news. Okay, this is the good news I alluded to earlier. All the things that I talked about, um, pair programming, story counting, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, those things, you can do that in Scrum. You can do that in SAFE. So the problem isn't necessarily with the process itself outside of the fact that it is encouraging bad behavior for everybody. These tools that can eliminate waste, that can get us moving forward faster with software and delivery, we can do that under any process, per se. Why? Because it adheres to the Agile manifesto. It adheres to Agile, what that means. So our job is to... Oh, sorry. should have clicked through this. Our job is to deliver valuable software right, to our customers. And that's hard enough. Right. If we can also not make it harder with all of our silly processes, 
I believe we'll be in a better state. Thank you.